Peace, everybody. For November 2022, we bring issue one of Living Proof magazine, a printed periodical magazine by Angel and Z Radio, now available on our Patreon, featuring TD, Anso, Cheek, Chino BYI, Rescue 246, Carnage NYC, Scott Vogel of Terror, and more. Issue one of Living Proof magazine will only be available for the month of November and will never be rerun. Living Proof magazine will be released periodically throughout the year and sent to our Patreon members. In respect of the great magazines of the past that shined a light on graffiti life and culture, related arts and scenes, Living Proof Magazine is here to bring the energy and style long gone from printed magazines of this nature. Issue 1 includes never-before-seen photos and stories from past era provided by Chino BYI, interviews from Rescue 246, Cheek, Carnage NYC, drawings and sketches from the notebooks of selected writers, portraits, bombing sequence shots, music selection from Scott Vogel, and more. Issue 1 will be shipped to our Patreon members for the month of November, will never be remade after November, and is available exclusively through our Patreon. Patreon members also gain access to AZ Radio, all of our videos like Savvy OTR and All We Got Is Us Too, our monthly products like Silver Mops, Prints, and Books, and our Patreon episode library with episodes from Dessa MTA, Bat, Rebo LNE, Acer 444, Lex PMS, Cash 4, Less YKK, and more. Peace and thank you to everybody who supports the show in any way. We cannot thank you enough. Blessings. Enjoy the episode. Hey, this is Claw Money, and you're listening to Angel and Z, sponsored by Art Primo. What is Art Primo, you ask? How dare you? Art Primo is a graffiti shop that was started by writers for writers in Seattle in 2001, and they have stayed true to their roots for over 20 years. Offering everything from caps to inks to paint to refillable mops. They got nibs, they got jibs, they got caps, solids, zines, books, and more. And their how to videos and YouTube channel are legendary. Art Primo strives to keep their prices low and quality high, hand pouring all of their mops and inks in their Seattle warehouse. Shipping orders on the same day, and their site is a source of information for all types of writing tools. Tools for what? Tools for the revolution. Thank you again. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Sure. Um, I just wanted to say that the shit that you and your you and your crew have done, the things that you've done with your life, have been such an influence to me, all three of us, and pretty much everybody who listens to our show. Uh, since all of us and all of our friends have been little kids, we've looked up to to you and just the things that you've done. So, That's immense good. thank, thank you, you for thank you very much for coming here. It's a huge honor for us. And shout out to Rehab for helping us uh, get in touch. And shout out to Rehab. Shout out to Rehab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shout out to Rehab. <laughs> um, how did you meet Rehab? How did I meet Rehab? Um, Rehab and I met. Um, That's a good question. I gotta open the file cabinet um so definitely on the street somewhere so back in the day we would just meet graffiti writers kind of like on the street you would like clock somebody and be like that dude writes graffiti yeah um now everybody kind of looks like everything but back then graffiti writers had a, had a particular look and um I, I used to see uh i went to manhattan center for science and math so i would take the six train to school in the morning uh, it's on 116th in the after drive, so I would take the 6th train. And Rehab had uh, the stations on the Upper East Side from, like, you know, 59th to 125th. Like, the Upper East Side stations with, like, um, uni paint tags, upside down R tags. And, like, so, I, so, so like, you know, it's like the Silence of the, lab, of the Lambs. Um, you covet what you see every day. Mm-hmm. You know, I saw, I saw Sags every day, so he was the man, right? And so um, I already was, like, you know... Who's rehab? Um, to answer your question, I actually don't remember actually the first time I met him, but I remember we were kind of like seeking each other out. So maybe I went to high school with G, right? Cope's brother. Um, he was like younger than me, but we went to the same high. He was way cooler than me, though. But um, by the way, um, so I knew people that knew him. And that's basically what graffiti was back then. Like you knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody. And eventually down the line, it was not even 60 weeks of separation. It was like 80 or something. But um, you would just meet people. So I think somehow, because I had, I was like on the street, I had run away. I was racking. I was skateboarding. I was like doing me. 
And I was just down to meet people as opposed to before when I was like, yeah, I'll need to meet graffiti writers or whatever. So I think I like needed to rack with somebody. G was trying, G put me onto racking powders, which was the baby and Famil, powdered baby and Famil to make money. He told me that rehab was doing that and that I should link with rehab. I think, I'm pretty sure G was trying to tell me to link with rehab. I don't think I had a beeper yet or a two way pager at the time. So it was just like one of those like weird ways, which seems super like ancient right now of like, you know, somebody told me to meet him here this day, that time. And then like, I kind of waited, you know, you just went places and waited back in the day for people to show up that you'd never met. And like, maybe they would show up or maybe like some other adventure would like kick off or whatever. But And um, you're like connecting through word of mouth. All the time. Um, and I can't even remember who's, word it or came with in which mouth it came out of or how it worked but it was something like that mm. so did you guys bond through racking or was it through mainly painting or like a mixture of the two i would say if i had to choose one it was racking for sure um because most people who rack like most people who do anything are derelicts most people who do podcasts are whack right so most people who do anything <laughs> are like bad at it right and um so and i wasn't and rehab wasn't he took it seriously and um, within the graffiti community, especially in the nineties, there was like this, um, other, other hierarchy of, uh, rackers, right. People who, who boosted or whatever for money, loot racking, we called it. So not just like, you know, run to a store and run out with some North face, but like, like racked for a living, like had some skill, you know, like knew what they were doing and were sophisticated and like, you know, um, it was a steady income racking, right. Mm -hmm. Good enough to do it all the time and make money at it. And so um, I had already like came into graffiti writing already shoplifting since I was like a little kid, with, like really good at it though. Like as a little, like a six year old kid stealing little Debbies and then stealing things from the supermarket that I was supposed to buy with the money and keeping the money for myself to play Ninja Turtles, arcade games or Street Fighter or whatever. So I was like already smooth and slick with it. And um, so when I started writing graffiti, I would just like come through with like mad markers and stuff and give them away to people. And they're like, what are you doing? Why are you like, you know, um, cause I, I just, it was just, it was just like, it's so easy to get like, and they, they were just like, why are you so nice? Stop being so nice. Um, so it was, uh, through that, like, like rehab was good. He relied on racking for survival for make for a living. I didn't necessarily, I wasn't convinced that I needed money hmm. right at the time. Um, cause I was like, I'm stealing everything I need and I don't really know why I would need money. Right, I wasn't doing drugs, and so what else do you need money for? Yeah, yeah. Right, um, stealing my clothes, stealing everything I need. You know, I, I don't know, but like whatever. You need money just to hang out sometimes. So go to a diner, and I'm like, oh, I can just steal food. Why don't you know? I don't even want to be in the diner. This is stupid. Sitting in a diner is stupid. Um, this was me like at 16 or 17, um, but I did it, and rehab was good. He was actually someone that I could hang out with that wasn't a derelict. That's what we really bonded on, um, that we weren't derelicts. So he wasn't a derelict at shoplifting. He wasn't a derelict at writing graffiti. He just wasn't a derelict at all the, most of the things that he did. And that's what I appreciated about him. He just happened to rack and write graffiti, but he was also like not like a, he didn't have a born to lose tattoo on his forehead or his chest anywhere, I don't think. <laughs> so that's what was like, okay, cool. He's chill. I can, you know, you have to be able to like read people without actually interviewing them. You have to be able to like, mm -hmm. just kind of like, okay, like, um, you know, understand like how far this friendship would go without actually telling them to their face. Like, okay, you're, okay, you're kind of a derelict. Or, but Rehab was like, oh, I, you're an actual, oh my God, you're, you're actually chill. Mm -hmm. <sighs> so many crazies out there. Um, and that was like a relief because again, homeless on the street, just kind of like, not to, not to like, play a violin, it wasn't a sad, it was like a, it was like an adventure. It was Super Mario Brothers, I was psyched. But also people sucked and rehab didn't suck. So that was cool. So so you felt like you didn't need money cause you could kind of just cut out the middleman. Like you need a lot of people, especially at that age, they need money for food, they need money for, you know, gear, they need money for, but you would just have all that stuff cause you were racking. So how long did you feel like you didn't need money for? Um, until it was like i mean i liked like i would go racking and make like 300 bucks racking powders or whatever and then like have the 300 dollars in my pocket burning a hole for like 
two weeks and then like, you know, and like go to a diner and buy like, you know, get like a banana pancakes with bacon or something or like cheeseburgers and french fries. And that's like a whole other thing of the eating habits. But like or like we would sneak into movies, which you could do back then. It was like there really wasn't much to spend on for a while. I met this dude and I moved in with him in the Bronx, Paul, rest in peace, Paul. Uh, and um, that was chill. But then I was in a relationship. So then it was like, OK, um, like, you know, uh, you got to kind of like not pull your own weight, but like just don't be like a uh, it's not a flop house. You can't just like sleep in all day and shit. So then I felt like he was like, yeah, you got to get a job. You can't be like, you know, just coming in all hours of the night and stuff. And I was just like. All right, Dick. Don't be, you know, it's chill. Um, I was really like rough around the edges. I like to think of myself as like, you know, as you hear me talking, like, oh, I was just looking for somebody nice and erudite and like intellectual to hang out with. But I was also like a crazy derelict. It was not like, you know, I fit in. It wasn't like I didn't fit in. Uh, and it wasn't until I was in a relationship with like an adult that I was like, oh, oh I'm the crazy one. Got it. Um. So I guess it was around then after I moved in with Paul in the Bronx on Bedford Park. And and it was like, you know, you want to contribute to the rent. Um, you want to like buy groceries. He was just like, just get a job because it's like better. It's like, that's the reason. Like, stop, right? Like the reason, <laughs> like you need a job to make you more normal. Mm. And I was like, I need money to help out being normal isn't necessarily a part of the equation. You can kind of cut that part out. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I see what he meant now. He just wanted me to like chill out because I was getting arrested every now and then uh, or like running from the cops or something or getting into fight. It was like always a crazy thing, staying out for like days at a time. Um, so it wasn't until I moved in with Paul I was in a relationship with somebody that I loved that I was like, oh, like let me like be like somewhat, pretend to be an actual human being, American Psycho style, like, like the peeling the face off, you know, like I, I can do this. I can be a normal person. Uh, so it was kind of around then, but then I also ended up getting a job in a mailroom at this bank that doesn't exist anymore. EAB bank. Do you know in Seinfeld, you know, when they would do like the segue to, um, Elaine's job at Jay Peterman, they used to show this building and it was 1325 had these flags going down. Well, the next time mm -hmm. you watch Seinfeld, it's these flags going up. It's 1325 6th Avenue. 1325 Avenue, I think so, yeah. And that's the building I worked in. It was my first, first job job. And I was in a mail room and it was it was like, that was also it was another funny story. But anyway, um, yeah, it didn't last too long either. But, but um, yeah. No, I was just going to ask, so looking back at those days, did you feel like, do you now have any regrets that you, in a way, acted like that or, like, did any of that stuff or it kind of made you who you are in terms of, like, character, experiences, or uh, no regrets? Um, whenever someone says no regrets, I think of the no regrets <laughs> tattoo, um, which I think I might get, like, no, <laughs> no regrets. Um, at least make that a t-shirt. Um do I regret anything? So like on one hand, I love my life and I love all the mistakes I've made and every like little scrape or like bruise or broken bone I have has like led me to this moment. And this today is the best day of my life so far because it's the best chance I have at life and using all the information I have to attack, you know, to move up forward to the future. Right. No, the other hand, it's like, yeah, I mean, it would have been great to go to LaGuardia instead of going to Manhattan Center, which was the plan. Um, it, you know, but what I, you know, who knows what that, you know what I mean? There is only one timeline, by the yeah. way, right? We all watch sci-fi stuff all the time. There's only one timeline the, the, that that's so that's what it is. Um, so to answer your question, um, you know, there's no point of even thinking about that. It is completely pointless <laughs> it, except to inform future decisions. Right. So I don't want to, um, you know. I want to keep my apartment clean because I've, I've lived in squalor before and it sucks. Right. So, you know, do I regret living in squalor like that? I had to learn how to yeah, not yeah. Li live in squalor. Right. Um, so I don't know, like, are there things that I regret? I, I always, like, I, you know, I was a derelict, but I was always a good person. Right. Never wanted to hurt anybody. Never wanted to kill anybody. I did fight people, but I would, I would always stop when they started bleeding. And I'm like, even if they were still talking shit, I'm like, we're done. Like, you're bleeding. I, I don't know. Like, 
I can't like beat, you know, I, I'm just, I just always was like, I know what my limits are. Hmm. Um, uh, so I don't, so I think I did the best under the, the circumstance. And the more information I got, the more I learned about stuff, the more informed I was to make better decisions. And I've always been someone who's looking for information like that. I'm like, I'm information hungry. Um, yeah, I like learning stuff. So like, you know. It's kind of like, you know, the the more you know with the rainbow and the star, it's like, it's true. The more you know, like, the sweeter shit gets, uh, or the less painful life is, right? Or rather, the more happiness there can be, right? The more serenity there, there can be. There will always be pain and all that stuff, but you want to like, be able to manage it, and you get to do that with information i feel like yeah which you got through your through your experiences right um in terms of like the the loot racking then to going to working in that job at the mail room when you were loot racking did it feel like you know i've heard about the like the high level rackers that exist for get, yeah. getting down to getting down to like uh to skill and just almost breaking it down to a science to the point where it really does become like a, a career and I've always wondered during that time period, at like the climax of you of you racking like that, was it like a full time job? Did it feel like that? Was it like you wake up, you go to the store, this at this hour, and then this? And how was that? It sucked. Um, so when I was doing it for fun, it was fun. And then when it became when I was like an adult and I needed money to pay for things and to pay rent and to you know, it totally sucked to have to rack for money, right? Um, it became like an actual job. It was stressful, except that this job I could get arrested, right? And it sucked because I knew dumb people, straight up idiots who had like legitimate jobs who had, you know, their lives together, but were idiots, right? And here I was thinking that I was like, you know, smart guy having to do this, this thing, right? This gross thing for money. It's like, I should be able to figure this out. I should be able to make money legitimately and not have to um, you know, cause racking, it's like gut wrenching. It's like, I need, I need like, you know, life happens. I need $600 by the end of the week kind of stuff. And it's like, okay. Um, and like every night is New Year's Eve and everybody's like out every night writing graffiti, like fucking drinking and doing Coke and like smoking weed all night, you know? And it's like, I have to, I like to wake up early. I've always woke, woken up early. Right. Like before the sun even, and like I'm up and Adam and like, you know, just like psyched to be alive. Right. So, um, you know, kind of staying out all night wasn't really my thing, kind of needed the drugs for that. Um, but I preferred to be in and, you know, um, I, I just like the sort of like uh, scheduling of like sleeping when I'm tired and then waking up early. And then, uh, so rehab was like really good about, I have these spots. We hit that spot like two weeks ago. Now would be a good time to circle back to that one. He may have even had a racking book, which is super dumb. But like um, <laughs> back then it was like, you know, a great idea. He was super tech. Um, but, you know, we mentally knew about what spots we wanted to hit and we would hit them methodically. And, um, you know, it's it was fucking whack so like we were good right and it was good to have somebody to do it with that takes a lot of the edge off but we couldn't necessarily do it all the time because we're two different human beings and we have different lives going on so sometimes we'd be like yo i need to go racking and i'd be like okay go racking then and he'd be like i need to go racking coon like come on and it's like all right cool we'll go racking or um and, it, and that just sucks yeah. you know what i mean um uh, I'm not even gonna like pretend like, but I was like super good. Like, right, I, I at one point I thought I was co convinced I was the best rocker in New York City. Although there was Hefs who was super good and I'm not sure that I was ever better than him. But I think before I knew that he was around, like it was like me, Adder and Hefs, I think were the best rockers at some point. Um, that could rack anything from anywhere at any time, pretty much. Um, can like always come off, you know what I mean? Um, like, you know, to to some extent, you know, you can't always, always, but you know. Um, yeah, that shit was fucking horrible. As I remember just like, like after I moved out of Paul's place, um, 
roommate situation, having to pay rent, being cool guy, staying out all night, and and like somehow like needing to like fall back on racking to like because I would spend all of my money that I worked that I got from a life or whatever job. You know, you just spend it. You know, what I mean, you get money to spend like no value. That was the problem with racking is that mm-hmm. money really didn't have the value that because I didn't wasn't working hard for it. And then when I was working hard for it, it didn't seem like a good um, return on the effort, right? Meaning um, when you were working a job and getting paid? No, no, no. The racking. It was like when well, yes, while I was working and I would still need to go racking to supplement my income, the racking didn't seem to be giving me enough, mm-hmm. right? I'm like, I should be paid more for racking. I'm that good. This isn't paying me enough. And then we found different things to rack that were paying more, which was actually bad because then I was like racking more. Um, So it took me, so I was like, but I was like aware of this. I was aware that it sucked, that I'm too smart for this kind of, like, it's just, it's just not the way I want to see myself in the future. Um, But like street cred, right? So like, and I'm good at it. So, but like, I don't, want to have to do this i haven't even like you know i hadn't begun to explore any kind of like legitimate sort of like source of income other than just kind of like working at the homie shoe store or whatever so which doesn't really go anywhere either there's no upward mobility there you have to sort of still make something of yourself and that really is work also and then i have to invest time and effort into which i was not good at I, i was not good at working at something so like everybody else was like either in college Right. Um, or had like or were close with their parents. Right. It just had, you know, something else going on. And we were like we were just kind of like Daryl's kind of out there, but liked hanging out with like people who were like in college or had something going on or like, you know, did something music, photos, like writing something. People who did something and graffiti writers, but also people who knew stuff about stuff and who were like learning shit, um, like art people, basically. Um, so, but it's like hard. It's like, you know, you know, just hanging out basically yeah, for yeah. years until like, you know, you're like, look, you gotta fucking like do something. Um, sorry to keep answering my own questions, but then what changed that was I got, um, I, get, I think I did the Infamy documentary. I was working at um, A Life, did the Infamy thing. That came out. The police saw it or Vandal Swat saw it. They like came in to A Life with stills from the thing. And they were like, yeah, you're under arrest. And I was just like standing there at the podium, like, oh, okay. Um, oh, okay. Oh, oh, this is okay. This is happening right now. Okay. And then went to jail. And then like, so long story short, and I hated court. I was just telling someone the other day, like I haven't been to court in so long. It's like the court sitting in court in those fucking like benches and like the whole thing of like just being in court all the time for something. And I haven't been in court in so long. And I'm like, I do not miss that for anything. Anyway, the uh, I was on probation for five years from that, right? And, right, I mean, yeah, I mean, but also like whatever, like, you know, it's like five years probation. With the exception of like having a shitty probation officer that didn't understand how awesome I was. And then um, having to do like drug tests that I thought I was beating because I was drinking the orange drink from GNC. <laughs> thought, emphasis on thought. Um, it was, I saw it as a good thing because I was like, yo, I'm gonna take this opportunity to like figure shit out and like do me and like, and you know, meanwhile, like people were doing stuff. I had like lots of like mentors, like Futura, Espo, Twist, like Reese, like all these dudes doing stuff that were graffiti writers that were doing stuff that wasn't necessarily graffiti, which I thought was like the worst thing you could do as a graffiti writer, like to grow up and professionally write graffiti, gross. So I was like, but you don't have to do, you could do whatever. You could do like what what the possibilities and thanks to those guys for letting like a smelly, like crazy, like, you know, kid hang around. They saw something in me that I didn't even see in myself. And they, which inspired me to like, be able to like, kind of like come up with stuff. And A-Life guys like Rob, Tony, Arno, Tammy, they were just like, yeah, you can come, you can come and hang out. And like, you want a job? And I'm like, for me, you know, like, cool. And like, I was just crazy when I think about it. But again, they saw something I didn't see in myself, which was great. And um, I learned a lot, started making t-shirts, spending all the money on weed, of course, but like, whatever, you know, I started doing things. And I saw, so I started creating value outside of like racking. 
and like, you know, standing up for my homies and like beating people up at parties and stuff. You know what I mean? It was like, there's, but like also the scene was expanding, mm. right? Or it was creating and then it was like actually expanding. Like people were waiting online for shoes. People were starting clothing brands with like actual business plans. And like, you know, like things were like starting to become like a real thing, right? And um, like the scene that exists now is just starting. And it just seemed like, oh, okay, there's like money here to be made or something. Um, but everybody's whack. Absolutely everybody who's taking advantage of this is whack because I've never seen you before. Like nobody knows you. You don't hang out. Like you're just some dude with t-shirts. Like fuck you. You're whack to everyone all the time. If I didn't know you or somebody, you, nobody could vouch for you, you were whack because the streets still, right? That's where street work came from were for people who were like around on the streets with some creative vision. And that's what, was, that's what it was. Then all like everybody started like jumping in and it became like this colorful, like all over print thing with sneaker brands attached to it. And it was just like, everything's whack. Everybody's whack. Super hater. I made hating an art. Those skills didn't pay any bills though, but I was like, so about it. And I just like, you know, I'm like, oh, I want to make t-shirts too. Like this, like, this is a real thing with real people. Mm -hmm. But also you can't have it because it's a crew. And it was like, a weird, I had to figure this shit out. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? So the five-year probation gave me like a exit out of like having to rack all the time. Um, like that push that I needed that I wouldn't have done myself necessarily. Or it would have taken longer. You know, just like... I saw that opportunity. I saw it as an opportunity to like, you know, well, you want to do something different. You want to fucking like take your rightful, like, you know, place and like this whole like shit show and like maybe kind of like figure shit out or whatever, or like, or you're desperate enough to actually fucking have to need to do something else. You can't do this forever. You're, you're, you're if you get arrested on probation, you're going to jail. I had gotten used to jail. The last time I got arrested, I gotten used to it. I was like there for two weeks and I was just like, whatever which scared the shit out of me because jail sucks yeah. and the people in there are whack and you have to dumb yourself down just to get along. And I was just like, yeah, it's cool. Like, it's on TV. You know what I mean? I like was down kind of. And I was like, oh, this is bad. Like, ah, uh, like, and so I was like, cause I do illegal stuff. Like I could be here like more, this is whack. Um, so I, you know, I just kind of like, didn't like where my life was headed basically. And I, you know. Yeah. Luckily had options. Yeah. Honestly, um, I have so much to say about what you just said. It's first off, like when I think about um, that era of time, which, you know, obviously like we didn't live it, but we've seen it. We've, mm -hmm. we've read about it. We've seen the videos. Everybody has. And like that time period in New York and then in, in this like few mile radius of a place produced people like you guys produced like KR, Futura, Steve Powers, Clay and Patterson's like in a few span of a short years, like all these absolutely monumental things went down that seriously had an impact absolutely worldwide forever. Um, and like throughout all that time period, like you're living the way that you're living, you're explaining to us like all the stuff that you were doing, you know, like you're, you're, you're loot racking, you're working at a life. You're like, you know, doing the thing with Iraq when you were living that time period, did you like see that for what it was like, oh, this is a monumental historic time period or are you just kind of living in the moment when you were starting Iraq, like, or even let's say like a few years in, did you feel that way? Like, how did you feel and how do you feel looking back on it now? Um, short answer, not really. Right. Because like, you know, living moment to moment kind of, and like just trying to like take it all in stride or whatever. But um, again, my perspective is not what it is today, which is like being in gratitude and like kind of like like appreciating community and realizing how lucky I am and like having that be like more of the like drive to do more things. It was more like, yo, I'm the smartest motherfucker you've ever seen and everybody owes me everything. And why am I not the one every time somebody did something? I'm like, that should have been me. That should have been me. My attitude was totally fucked, right? Mm -hmm. um, everybody owed me everything. I also hated myself, but you should love me because I'm the best ever, but I fucking suck. But like, you know, um, but isn't New York great like that? Like so many, like, like all the important things that, that have ever happened in New York City have happened on the same streets. It's so fucking amazing. People don't get it when they're walking around looking for coffee. They're like, this is like where it happens. Like, this is where so many, like everything dope basically has happened here, you know, um, like everything dope that's happened on the street has happened on the street. It's the same street. Like look at the sidewalk. Like this is it right here. Um, yeah, I, I trip out about that a lot. 
um, like all the scenes are connected. Yeah. Like throughout time, they're all connected through people, human, actual human beings. Like no internet. It's all like people meeting people, meeting people, and like. I liked being with Jack Pearson or I like being with Jack because he was like around in the 80s. They were doing the same thing in the 80s as they, as, we're, as we were doing in the 2000s. It was a 20 year difference. And like that connection is like insane that like you're and then there's people now 20 years later doing the same thing. And it's like it's super amazing to sort of still be alive to experience that. Right. Because that's a whole other thing, like not being here for it. Um, ben tweeted something the other day, like because um, he's turning 40 tomorrow and he was like, oh, do I. What's my um, advice to young kids? Don't die in your 20s, right? It's like, yeah, that. Like, just stick around. Don't, you know, quit before the miracle happens or whatever. Um, uh, sorry, I forgot the question. Oh, good. Uh, no, I was just asking you how you felt during that time period. Did you feel like... Did you feel like when you were when you were starting up Iraq and it was just first starting, do you feel like it was something like... Special. Historical, special, significant, immense impact? Is that how it felt? Like... Uh, I'm just gonna default to what I was saying earlier. I was like my, I was like full of myself kind of, but also thought I was a piece of shit. So I would like went from one extreme to the other. There was no real like, um, um, yeah, my perspective was not in reality necessarily. Um, so depending on who I was talking to, I didn't deserve to be talking to them or they didn't deserve to be talking to me. Um, and it just sucked. It was a horrible way to live. And like, you know, I was stoned all the time. Anytime I meet somebody from that I haven't seen since back then, like, oh, I met you at A Life once. I the first thing I do is say, I'm so sorry. Um, because I just assumed <laughs> that I was a dick, you know? Because I just remember being like so unhappy all the time. But people were like, no, you were nice. And I was like, maybe on the outside, again, I'm like American psycho, you know? I was not um like, hey, how you doing? But not inside, it was just like, can't wait to get away from this person and like go get high or something. Mm -hmm. Um but I'm glad that like I, people were able to enjoy me. So back then, I don't know. I felt like I was lucky to be around people who were doing those shit. I recognized that, like all the stuff that A Life was doing, Clayton, like you know, um, Futura, um, Futura, Super Futura, um, Espo, uh, Todd James, like you know, like all those dudes, all the graffiti writer, all the graffiti writer dudes who were like doing shit. Um, I can see their, cause it, like, you know, their stories had already like changed and you can see that even cause, you know, like, like, like cap, like, like people who were like, who were just around before me were always like, you know, when you're growing up, I, the older people are the ill ones, right? Mm -hmm. They're the people you look up to. And so I could recognize it in them. They saw something in me that I can see in younger people now, but I couldn't see in myself at the time. So no, it didn't seem ill. Plus I didn't, I didn't know that anything was going to like connect, right? Um, people would be like, you know, come in from other countries all the time and be like, oh, like I've heard of you like at A Life. And I'd be like, OK, but not really know, you know, that happened kind of often. And I was just, you know, whatever. I don't know. You know, I guess, you know, and I know that that doesn't happen to everybody. So like that's kind of cool, but like still no perspective, really. Mm -hmm. Right. Until I started traveling more. And then I was like, oh, this is Milan. Like, oh, and everybody I see people I know because they came to me. I'm like, oh, this is so sick going to Japan all the time and then like seeing people that I know from here. And it's like, oh, this is sick. The world, yes, like I'm super lucky to have been born and raised in New York and have my whole story be told there because like I'm literally in contact with like people from all over the world. This is fucking amazing. And that was like even like, even before the internet really started to jump off with like free texting and everything and like, like broadband. Early internet doesn't count because we weren't really connected like that. But um, yeah, like, it took a while for me to appreciate what was happening. Um, I went through a dark period where I was just like hiding in the Bronx and the River Park Towers, which is like, um, it was like, you know, whatever. There was a dark period. Just to answer your question, no, I didn't really, really appreciate it. I bounced from being, um, I, I didn't bounce from being, I was uh, the biggest piece of shit in the center of the universe to use like a, a um, phrase that I've heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when, when, from an outsider's perspective, when I look at and hear about all that, I think about like there's a saying in like martial arts where they're like, there's black belts and then there's black belts. And I kind of think of it in terms of like graffiti, like there's like New York graffiti crews, which there are so many. And then there's New York graffiti crews. And out of all the New York graffiti crews, pretty much uncontestably, the most influential one, the most the one that's known and is, is Iraq. 
And it's That's just, so crazy. That's so crazy. And I've talked to a lot of people about this and That's insane, actually. <laughs> So you're talking about, do you ever recognize, did you ever recognize me? I, like, I'm able to recognize this right now, that this is happening right now in the moment. And it's crazy. It's, it's, it's overwhelming. That's like, insane. Yeah. And like the funny thing to me is that. No one's ever said that to me before. Oh, really? Yeah. The, the funny thing to me is the fact that I think that what I just said, in my opinion, is a fact. And yet when I talk to rehab and now talking to you, both of you kind of were like, we didn't really realize. And another thing that I think is like pretty inspiring is that it didn't, it was truly organic. Like you had zero plan. You wrote graffiti and chilled every day. And just through, like, like you said, everything's connected. All these people are connected. Everything just is, is one. Mm -hmm. It's somehow like turned into this crazy shit. Uh, to me, that's insane that like it can work from an outsider's perspective. Like I said, I know living, it was a different story, but it can seemingly work so perfect and ideally uh when there was no plan and there was right. no like real like intention like oh we're racking let's uh call the crew this and then somehow now like everybody knows about it like to me like i can't like i feel like and I, i'm definitely wrong in saying this but when i was like 12 years old and i first found out about like what iraq was i was like okay sick i'm gassed because i'm like the only person who's my age like who knows about this mm -hmm. And now like every, I walked by labor the other day and there was like, and I, I was with him and I was like, I'll look and I rag to you. Like, isn't that funny? Like a bunch of skateboarders and like, I grew up skating, we grew up skating, like, but no skater knew really what that like was. And now everybody knows what it is. Like, what is that? When you look at the trajectory of, tra trajectory of your life, like, what do you think about when you think about that? So that's a really good question. That, that could be a podcast in and of itself. I should probably start doing podcasts again, but. Um, contrary to how it seems, I don't like hearing myself talk. Um, but so back in the day, everything was like in its separate, it was like a club with different rooms of like music, right? It was like uh, skateboarding was over here. Graffiti was over there. Hip hop was over here. Like everything was separate. Uh, and by over here, I mean like those friends like this, these friends like that, those, you know, they were not the same group of people, right? It wasn't homogenized. It wasn't mixed in. Um, maybe you had a skateboard friend that liked hip hop and maybe you had a graffiti friend that the skateboarded maybe, but not probably not. So I, so we were like those kids that liked all of it. We like hardcore music. We like fucking fashion stuff. We like, like fine art stuff. We like low art stuff. We like, you know, it's like, there's all of it is dope. Mm. Like, you know, homeless people on the street. And like, you know, we just saw like this thing, right? Like, the, like how everything is basically connected and is dope and there's creativity and everything and like everything informs everything else, but it wasn't like the way that the world worked. Right. So, um, you know, once I heard that there were like, uh, like I would see like certain graffiti writers up at skate spots and I'd be like, yo, that guy must skate. Mm. Oh my God. Like that's ill. Um, it freaked me out. Or, or like, you know, you would see like a skateboarder at an art show. Right. And it'd be like, yo, like that freaked me out. That shit was not like, because now you see like, you know, mm -hmm. skateboarders have art shows, you know. Sure, there was like um, a legend gallery where it was like, a, you know, all skateboarders showed up at, that, at those Aaron Rose shows or whatever. And, you know, certain like things, but like it wasn't, it was like, it was rare. It wasn't like how it is now. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I'm trying to remember the question so I can properly put. I know what I want to talk about, but what was it again? It was. It like, was just like, what do you think? Seeing as Iraq got to the level that it did, but while it was happening, it wasn't really like a plan. When right. you look back on the path of your life and all the ups and downs that you've lived, like all the lessons, experiences, like good times, bad times, what do you think about all that now that it's all panned out the way it has? Um, I, I don't know what to think. Um, that I'm extremely lucky. Um, to be alive and to um. Not just to be alive, but to uh, be in the position I'm in to to be able to appreciate things, right? And because, a, not everybody makes it. The herd thins, right, immensely more than you think it is going to. Like, just people don't make it, right? And then it's like, why am I here? Like, I'm not like they're way better, smarter, iller. Like, why, you know? Um, so, which is not a, just because as humans we can propose questions doesn't mean that we need they deserve to be answered, right? So it's like, okay, whatever, stop asking questions that don't have any real answers, right? Like you're just here, right? So what do you do with that? You, you know, um, you, it's, you're, you're lucky, right? So, so, you know, um, uh, you know, kind of like give back, like, 
to tell people about the people that, that aren't here that didn't make it, like your story, every, use uh, your story to help other people, how I got from there to here, that helps people, all that kind of stuff. Um, Am I going to ask you what the question was again? <laughs> yes. It, it, you know, the thing is, is the question was just very broad. I'm just asking, like, what, what goes through your mind when you look at all the ups and downs and then where you, not that your story is over, but where you landed today? Yeah, no, it, it's insane. I can't, I can't, I can't really comprehend it. So I got sober like four and a half years ago, right? And it's like, um, I wasn't the drug addict. I didn't have needles sticking out of my arm. I was the one that kicked needles out of people's hands, you know, and like, like was like, you know, fuck that shit, just weed and coke. What else do you need? Don't be a dick. And like, so I wasn't the one with the drug problem. But when I did get sober, my life got immediately better, right? So, and now I realize like, oh, what happened when I did drink was gross. Like I had to call a coke dealer. And like, even before I got my butt in the seat or like the beer touched my lips, I was like, do, 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 you know? So alcoholic. Um, but like my life got way better once I got sober, right? So. I just like to like, I'm like, dude, like I really should be dead all the time. Like I, I have like 13 screws in my leg, right? And a metal titanium bar on my ankle, coating my ankle together from sketching back to a life from Canal Street, Charlie Gokap getting fronts, right? Like fronts in my mouth, like sketching, car accident crazes, like my foot hanging on by the skin and everything. And I'm trying to like get back to the store and some like fireman like pushes me down. It's like, I call it, it's like a whole thing. I should be dead is the long and short of that, right? I should, oh, many times over. Um, so I'm just fucking like, the story is really dope. It entertains me sometimes. Like when people ask me questions like this, cause I don't really think about it in completion all the time. So it's a fucking crazy story. Um, I'm happy to, like, no one survives their story. We all die, but like, I'm happy that I survived this long. This is great. So just that, so like, I'm grateful long and short. I'm just grateful, right. To, um, because some people that live, right. Don't really get anything out of it. Right. They go through all this shit and it's just like, poor me. Look at all the shit I I've been through. Look what God did to me, man. Or like, you know my mom or like the cops or this, like everybody's got shit. Like everybody's bringing shit with them. Nobody escapes childhood unscathed. Like we all have mad baggage, right? What are you gonna do with it, right? You're gonna carry it around forever? Cause that shit's heavy. Like, you know, for me, I'm like, like, no, like, okay. Like, what do I, like, can I like, how can I use this to grow or something? Or like, can, can this benefit me somehow, right? Kind of a thing. So, um, but that wasn't always the case. I was a dick for super long because look what God did to me kind of thing. Even though I was an atheist, it was like, you know, fuck everybody all the time. But, you know, perspective changed. So I'm just grateful that I'm at that point mentally that I can actually, um, you know, um, make something that people appreciate, appreciate other people, be cool with myself, right? Because that was the whole thing is like being cool with myself. Now I can be cool with other people and I can see that people are more comfortable around me. That makes me feel good about myself cycle, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that part is what kind of like really super important to me more than like the, the Iraq thing and like that, how that it's like, cool, whatever. Me as a person not being such a derelict and actually being able to appreciate my life and realizing how lucky I am and being able to like make nice things that I appreciate and lucky because tons of people make great stuff right? There's tons of artists and musicians that make great stuff and nobody gives a shit, right? So I'm lucky that other people know about me and like appreciate anything and like that. I'm just lucky so many times over. Sometimes I feel like I won the New York lottery and that like I grew up here and I get to still live here. And like, I'm like, you know, I have a, like a decent apartment and it's like in a nice neighborhood. And I'm like, that's a fucking like rare. Like the people that I went to high school with, I don't know where the fuck they're scattered about. G is the only one I know who's who still lives in New York and is doing well. Like that's the, everybody else is a derelict. Like, so to be able to be together mentally enough to like not like um, torpedo my life, you know, or like feel sorry for myself all the time or like be in resentment to like, like those five people that will always like whatever they better run like you know what I mean? This is like <laughs> my life is like chill today. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, we're good to do this fucking podcast for these. Things. It's like no, like, I get kids want me to do a podcast or like that's that's awesome or whatever. Like you know, show up for stuff. You know, just don't be in your head all the time. Like these little lessons, like you know what I mean? Because not everybody my age gets to 
when I was a kid, a 40 or 50 year old dude was a fucking dick in New York. Those you were scared of old, like older grown men. They were like, they have grown men muscles. And you were like scared of them because they were fucking dicks and people were fighting all the time in the street. And like, you were just scared of like some like older dude flipping out on you. And it was like, you know, or the wrong kind of older dude. And it was just like, so I'm glad that it's like, you know, I, I feel young. Like, you know, I'm like, you know, mentally I feel like, you know, mature or m more mature. It's just like chill. Like I'm really happy. And plus that other shit, the Iraq stuff and like the fact that I get to make art and create things and people like are down for like, you know, my shenanigans now and they support me. And it's like, oh, this is also fucking nice. Like that's what I mean. Like today is the best day of my mm -hmm. life. It's like, yeah, I get to like appreciate all that shit. It's, it's fucking dope. Yeah, that, that's honestly amazing. And, and congrats on being sober. You know what I mean? Uh, you. you know, we've talked to a lot of people who have kind of went through the same uh, style of thing of, you know, using for a while or using whatever it is that they're using and then, you know, getting off of it. So every day counts. And that's amazing to hear. Another thing is that in a in some written interview, you talked about how like a long time you, you, you would think you wanted uh, like money and fame for like maximum satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And then as you got that, you started to realize like, Oh, actually, this doesn't give me like real lasting maximum satisfaction, rather like showing people like what is possible, being an inspiration or, or making people like just realize what is possible is a lot more, you know, giving back th through your gratitude and just through your work, people seeing it, believing in themselves and all that. And uh, I personally think that you have accomplished that part as well, because it's so funny, like even even before maybe, but like the past era you that a lot of people have observed because there's a lot of like media on that mm -hmm. on that version of you and stuff like that version of you at least to me like just speaking for myself made me think like oh shit like this is how like this is like a different style of life you can live like you can experience more like i want to experience more i don't just want to have like a boring life and obviously like i'm young i'm not understanding like everything else is coming with it however it opened my eyes to like oh there's not just this path there's also this path and the fact that you were, you know, I idolized graffiti writers and like the fact that you were showing your face, I'm like, what's good with that? Like, why is he like, why is he showing his face? And not many, <laughs> not many people did. So where did that, where did that come from? Why did you start showing your face? And besides them coming to a life after infamy, like did anything come of that? Um, yeah. So I just thought that was one of the corniest things about graffiti writers, which is like, oh, I'm like Zorro. And like, you know, it's just like. <laughs> nobody cares about you like no one cares like we're, we write graffiti on the fucking wall wow literally white writing on walls wow big deal right um uh you know yeah but the cops and this and that it's like there's like eight million people in new york city like you really think they're like dessa was on was in the like he's like dessa and like you no one a you're not up that much nobody's coming after you um, but then, so beyond that, beyond the, like, you know, putting other graffiti writers down who do that or whatever, like, do, like, do whatever you want to do, right? Hide your face, don't hide your face. Banksy makes a really good thing about not, like, you know, it's, it works for him, right? Mm -hmm. But he did it in the ultimate way, made it like an art thing that was like, like, just the hiding your face as an art. That's that respect, right? But for me at the time, it was like, I was like, okay, graffiti is not like the end all, right? So... The value is in me, right? I was lucky that I had self-esteem, right? So um, like I said, like I didn't think I was like a loser, right? So I didn't think that because I wanted to skateboard or write graffiti that I was a loser, even though that's what society was trying to tell people, like you're wasting your time, um, you're, you know? Um, I was just like, I'm not a fucking loser. Like I've seen losers, like I'm not a loser, right? So um, and th thank you to my parents for that, right? For instilling that um, self-confidence, right? And, uh, and school also, you know, like I was like, I'm not, I'm definitely one of the smart, I'm not a loser. I'm just not a loser. So the, the value wasn't in necessarily the graffiti writing. The value was in me, right? So, which I clearly, clearly saw as day. So I'm like, well, right. I'm not like, like it, it wasn't like clearly like, oh like if you don't show your face like you know you'll I was just like dude like I'd already like maybe done some modeling for certain people like maybe for a life or like you know I knew a lot of photographers half the people I knew were photographers and they're like yo do this thing like be in this thing and um so it's like like I'm trying to bring it all together 
right? I'm trying to bring all the things together. It's all me, right? Um, I don't know how, like, what value there is in like hiding from everybody that I write graffiti. Like, that's actually dope, right? Again, Espo, Reese, uh, Futura, like Twist, like people know who they are. Like, like it doesn't have to be cover your face like all the time. Like, so, and and because I like, I didn't have the actual outcome answer, like ending to the, anything, but I'm like, it, this doesn't make sense to me. And it's not like, I don't have to do what everybody else is doing. I just don't, like, it's dumb. Yes, there will be drawback because documentary and I, I want people to see it. I want it to get out there. So that means the cops might see it and like, okay, we'll cross that bridge when it gets to it. Um, I'm not plotting to like, you know, um, run airplanes in the buildings. It's just graffiti, like whatever, we'll see what happens. And I did get caught. I knew when it happened, I was like, oh, that's right. I didn't want to cover my face. Okay. And like, I like, well, they were like, oh, can we come to your house? And can we, uh, Doug Prey was like, can we like go to A-Life? And I'm like, sure. Like somehow like there's value in all of this and expose, like not exposing, but like sharing, right? Like the reality, not like oversharing, like internet, like, hey guys, look at me in the hospital. But like, this is the reality of the situation, right? This is like, you know, there was something there, like the honesty about it was like where the value was for me. So it was more about that, more about being honest. Like, yeah, it's illegal, but like, I'm not a bad person and I know I'm not a bad person. And like, you know, um, there has been something done for me by other people that has, that tells me that this is okay. Yeah. Right. Even though the cops may not like it or society may say no or something and the laws or whatever, I know better. Um, I'm, you know, my moral compass is like not off here. This will eventually be a, a, a net positive, mm -hmm. even though right now in the short term, it, it um, that's like the only thing I had foresight with really. It was like, no, no, like, like the value is in me, like, you know, whatever, it'll all work out. Yeah, like it's better to actually show your face for that reason eventually, like somehow the things will pan out and like, I mean, we're sitting here now 20 years later, but back then it was just like, if you can imagine not knowing that everyone continuing to hide their face, like not just from the cops, but from other graffiti writers, right? It was, it's violent, right? Like, you know, there's beef and like some most graffiti writers sold drugs and like did illegal shit. And it was just like other shit other than graffiti. That was like the mild thing that they did. So it was just like, people didn't, and it was New York. You just didn't want people knowing who you were. But I, again, was like was around people who were different and i felt like you know things were going like that there 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 can be a different sort of um life right it, it doesn't exist here now but i can see it existing mm. like i can uh, you know I'm, I'm moving toward that i can make it kind of thing i can make the life that i want how uh how was it moving forward like continuing painting after getting arrested like was it in the back of your mind before you hit a spot like oh shit that just happened they know who i am 100 percent or even to this day, like if you want to hit a spot, like do you ever think about that? I realized when they arrested me that they didn't give a shit, right? It wasn't like, you know, Vandal Squad is like, A, Vandal Squad are kind of like, they, they were kind of like fans of graffiti. You kind of have to be rolling around, looking at graffiti, being like, oh shit, fucking remills around here right now. You know what I mean? Like they're fans, right? So, and they would actually try to get people to hit their black books and stuff when they were, like, it's like, you know, they're grown up dude. They're like, cops are like, whatever, like, um, who said this? Uh, I forget, but I want to quote people and sound smart. Anyway, um, it's hard to be a, a good cop because the institution of policing is fucked up, but there are good people who are cops, right? Like Jerry, right, is is a nice guy, but when he's like being a cop, he has to like go along with like, you know, the gang mentality or whatever. So like cops are like just generally like, you know, they're just people, right? So like the Vandal Squad was just like, a bunch of dudes, right? Uh, who got to like fucking like, you know, you know, fuck with graffiti writers for a living. They did not care. Like they didn't give a shit. They're not, they're, they're not, they just don't care, hmm. right? Um, because they're kind of a joke within the police department because murders and like babies and microwaves and stuff. And it's like graffiti, like what? Like you guys, come on. Like, yeah, yeah. and that's, the, you know, so it's kind of like, they're like graffiti writers in, in the police thing, you know? So, and within the police department, kind of feel sorry for them a little bit. So, um, 
I, I realize that like, you know, you're evaluating the entire thing as the arrest is happening and like, you know, you're in the precinct and they're interviewing you and then you're doing court. I'm evaluating the whole thing for what it is. And I'm like, nobody really cares. This is not like a big deal, right? Um, like I can see where graffiti wouldn't, I would I could imagine like graffiti not even being illegal someday or like they, they're giving me like a key to the city, like, you know, some sort of like card where it's like, they put, you know, they put my name up or something, my photo and all the precincts. He's allowed to write graffiti. He's like key to the city kind of guy. Like that's like where my head goes with it. Like it's not, it's a net positive trust. There's, this is not as bad as they want you to think it is. The broken windows thing doesn't apply with graffiti, as you can tell now, because murals are like, oh, that means it's popping. You know what I mean? Uh, opposite of broken windows effect. Um, so like, whatever, like when I wrote graffiti after I got caught, it was like, hey, I'm going to do me. I like writing graffiti. I like being bad. I like tagging on shit. It's fun. I'm addicted to it. It's great. Like, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. Um, the self-preservation part was, I'm not up enough. Okay, so there are people who go after it. LeBron James style, Beyonce, Jay-Z style graffiti, right? Like, I'm going to be graffiti, right? There are those people. Just like with skateboarding, there are people who fucking crush and go after it. Like, Nigel, right? Like, okay, like, enough, dude. Like, we get it. You're good. You're good. You're good. Right? And then it's like... um, they want to like crush you with their skill or maybe they're just like really that good. But like I fantasize about myself, like crushing people with my success. I'm going to be the best you. And you know, it's just like, okay, dial it back, dude. Like just have some yogurt and chill out, you know, like just, you know, just do the next five minutes, the next five hours, like go to sleep, like brush your teeth, wait, you know, like just chill. Um, so there are people who, who are like that in graph. Right. And it's like, yeah, if you're like out there trying to like be front man on front street with graffiti, like, and like, you know, maybe that was never my thing. Again, the value isn't in the actual graffiti. The value is in me, right? I can make the, t the one tag that I have seem more than the 30 fillings this other guy has. I already know that, that there, that's an equation that you have to be able to figure out. How do you make your tag worth more than his fill-in? That's a thing. Right. If Futura takes a tax and where if cost takes a tax and where it's worth more than like all of the uh, I don't want to name a graffiti writer because, you know, whatever. But like pick your graffiti writer who just does graffiti. Right. Like your fillings don't mean anything to this one tag that people like Banksy. There you go. People will come and like take a picture of a Banksy thing from other countries and not give a shit about your fucking fill in. Mm. Right. Um, are you, are you maybe you don't do graffiti good in that in that case. Right. Because he's figured something out that, you, you know what I mean? It's like whatever. Um, graffiti purists are like, no, but I just do graffiti. It's like, okay, cool. But still like, great. Like have fun with that. Let me know how that works out for you. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I, I, again, I knew that like, I am a person who writes graffiti. I'm not a graffiti writer necessarily. Right. I, I am, but like I do other things. Graffiti doesn't have to like be my identity. So like, I'm not worried about the cops, like trying to like make an example out of me. They had to come after me because I did the documentary. They had to go after everybody. I, I wasn't lawyer, a lawyer up. Like I wasn't able to sort of protect myself legally like I would be today. I seriously doubt like cops would even like try to, like it's not even a thing. Like they'd be like, oh, that guy? I mean, we could find somebody else mm -hmm. who does way more graffiti and has, uh, you know, it is a loser. Yeah. versus like trying to take this guy to court who would like probably bring some like fancy liberal like you know this is like they're not it's like not a thing that they want to you know again down squad they don't care it's, yeah. they don't really care so factoring all that in it's like yeah i can write graffiti this is how much graffiti i can write where the cops would like still not give a shit right this is where it gets in the red zone and that's where they have to come after me because mm -hmm. it's i'm like obviously doing too much doing the most so and it's like well, I can like live in this area and still be dope, right? I can still like, you know, I I like myself. I'm kind of cool, you know? So like, let me like, you know, my, you know, whatever. Like my signature like represents me. Hmm. People know who I am. That's the value in people knowing who I am is that that's, oh, that's Kunle. You know what I mean? There, there's more to it than like just the graffiti that lives on the street. Again, nothing wrong if that's what you do and that's what you want to do. You just want to do fill-ins. That's awesome. I love fill-ins. Um, but my, plus I just like tagging. So whatever, you can't like destroy the city with tags. Um, but whatever, like, you know, whatever, like, 
it's like, whatever, I got arrested. I paid my debt for that. And, you know, if you want to, like, arrest me for something else, you're perfectly within your legal right to do that, you know. Um, but, you know, I'm, you know, there's way more. There's always some, like, a bigger fish to fry. I'm not really that guy. Yeah. And do you want to make an example out of somebody who's actually a, sort of net positive for, like, people in general? Mm -hmm. Is the way I feel, right? It's like, you know, it, it, it's unpopular to try and take me down, I think. Yeah, I would think. How did you get into um, and how long ago did you get into drawing? I was drawing like when I was super young. Um, so my father was an artist and he went to Pratt. He's from Nigeria. He was from Nigeria. He died like maybe 12 years ago or something. But um, super creative dude, super snappy dresser, like super snappy dresser. Always wear a belt if your pant has belt loops. You can tell a lot from a man by his shoes kind of dude. Um, very strict. But an artist and creative guy and did like magazine PR and stuff and like started his own little Nigerian magazine and like literally every Nigerian, like at his funeral, he had like, you know, 300 Nigerian dudes that I've never seen before that all knew him because he used to help people like uh, that dudes come to the United States. He had friends at the UN and get settled like business that like he was just like one of these people that was like important to a lot of people. Right. That I didn't even know about. Um so my mother was always like, yo, you're an artist too. You're so creative. You know, it's almost like, all right, mommy, you know, but like it stuck with me. And I always thought like, I was super creative and like in kindergarten, people were like, oh, you're so good. You're so creative. And then first grade, same thing. Second grade, I was like the best artist in class until junior high school, uh, smaller fish, bigger pond kind of thing. And then there's like, dude, who can draw anybody's face and like, girl who can paint whatever. And I'm just like, oh, I don't want to ever draw again. This is whack, I'm not the best. Um, but I got really good at playing the flute. Like I was the best in the school at playing the flute, which was weird. I was like, what, who, how do I, I don't even know. Like how do I, how do, well, I don't know. Um, and they were like, you need to go to LaGuardia for art and music, which never panned out, long story short. But, um, Doubling, oh, what the fuck was I talking about? What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> no, the question was, um, the question was how you got into drawing. Oh, right. But I was drawing like at a super young age, thanks to my parents and um, like just generally, oh, my, yeah, a, generally a creative, um, uh, you know, um, environment at home, like, encouraging creativity and stuff and and also like, you know, kind of fashion also like, you know, my father would wear traditional clothes sometimes or a mix between traditional and like he would wear like, 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 like indigo blue jeans. Right. And like he had these like brown cowboy boots that he would wear with the jeans over the boots. Right. So you just see the boots. And I was thinking this guy's weird. Bell I would always like iron his clothes, like, you know wash his ring around the collar, like press his scarves and stuff. Like he taught me how to do all this stuff. And like, it's like, you know, whatever. He was a scary dude, but like, you know, I learned a lot, right? Of, of the, just the way that he like always, like when he left the crib, he was just always so crispy, right? And I was just like, like that's my dad. Like he's like, he was mad crispy. Um, so I learned a lot about like, like what fashion means, not in like the, um, you know, whatever, big F, but like just in general, culturally, like what does it mean to dress yourself? What does that mean about you and like how people see you and all that other stuff? In any capacity, like if you're just like black gap t-shirt, fucking cargo shorts guy, like that is a choice that you're making and that's says a lot about, you know, whatever. And that, and then also with creativity, also with like um, actual drawing and stuff. And I remember when I got into skating, I started drawing like skulls and like snakes going through skulls and stuff. Like, right, it's like going through the eye holes and whatever, slithering around like a tattoo or whatever. I think like, didn't Bart and Milhouse get those like fake tattoos? That one thing where they're like this. Anyway, so I would draw, and my mother would freak out. Like, what are you doing? Like, what is this? And I'm just like, I had one of those pens that did the four colors and I was like doing like, all, I was just like wasting all the ink, like making it like super tech. And like, I thought it was really great. And she was just like shitting all over it. But it was like kind of too late, you know, I was already like, no, this is dope. You don't even know. Like, um, so like, I, I just, you know, like, I don't know, like I was always drawing. I stopped drawing for a while because I wasn't the best. 
And, you know, whatever, you grow up as a guy in the United States, but also in New York, like, you know, be the best at something. You have to be able to, like, break through walls and obstacles with your, like, brute force and intelligence, and you have to do it alone. Um, none of those things are true. Um, but at the time, I have to be perfect. I have to be the best. And if I'm not the best, I'm total shit. That was, like, a, you know, part of the reason for a lot of things also. Um like whatever, toxic. You grow up with toxic masculinity shit. You know, you gotta figure shit out. You know, the thing that you see on TV or in movies or you see other people do isn't necessarily what you have to do. But I'm lucky I figured it out. But because I wasn't the best artist, I like didn't want to do art. So I was doing skateboarding and graffiti, and I was like, cool. I also did art a little bit, but it wasn't like my main thing. And then when I started hanging out with people that like downtown who were like going to like art college and stuff, like all the colleges, you know, people were just like Ryan and all these people like who were like in school for art. Um, you know, they thought I was like really cool and like creative. And I was like, whatever, like you're going to like RISD or like whatever. Um, and I just, I just thought it was corny. People who went to school for art, I thought was like corny. Um, at the time I was just like, that's so whack. Um, Either you're good at it or you aren't. What's school going to teach you? Hmm. Um, so I just had this like negative look at like, you know, outlook on on art and stuff. And but like, you know, these people who were like, you know, informing my creativity, like really like helped inspire me to like kind of like try other different things. Right. Like I like to take photos. We like to make music and do music stuff um, and experiment in all sorts of different creative things that all informed me. Um, drawing more still i remember twist would be like every single time i saw him he'd be like yo are you still drawing every single time like he would give me a black book and he'd be like you'll draw something anything and i would like just draw something he'd be like oh my god that's so great and i'm just like this guy is great for my self-esteem like he's awesome i was because you know he's dope but he also like likes me and is like super positive uh energy like right and i'm just like this is california shit i'm like nobody is like that here um you're great. Like, take me home with you. Like, you know, um, but like, he would always say like, dude, like keep drawing. Don't ever stop drawing. And I'm like, Oh, like, yeah, I'm not like you. I can't do like crazy fades. And like, you know, he's like, dude, just don't stop. And of course I did. I would take like these long breaks and then like find myself getting back into it. And then I realized that it's like a part of like some sort of like, like, I don't want to say like therapy or whatever, but it like really like I kind of like needed to do it. It helped me sort of um, deal with the world or like help see the world in a different way that wasn't so negative. It like helped me understand things, lots of different things by drawing certain specific things or whatever. It like helped me to sort of understand the world in, a, in another way, like slow it down and sort of like meditate on things. And it was just like weird and freaky that I didn't understand that that's what it was for. That's how it was helping me. So you know yeah yeah it's amazing to hear and it's, it's cool to see you you know still doing it and just reaching a very high level with it and it being you know appreciated by pretty much everybody thank you i appreciate that do you have any um future plans with that or future plans with iraq or anything that you're doing any future stuff yes uh <laughs> yeah i mean like uh hopefully like work on you know uh have more art shows shout out to 56 henry and border Lamy gallery and um already at uh, one trick pony in la um yeah there are people there are galleries and people who believe in me and like would love to see more stuff from me and like and of course i would love to show with them so that would always be something that i'm open to and will be doing soon i guess as soon as i get some shit together um iraq there's all sorts of stuff going on um which is great it's super amazing. I'm super grateful for all of it, for any attention that anybody gives me. Because again, like, you know, smelly, crazy guy with like, you know, rough around the edges and like people are like welcoming me to do things. So thank you for dealing with me, anyone and everyone. And um, yeah, there's like tons of stuff, like little things. I don't really even like, it's just like wake up, do the thing, like answer the email, like, and like, so things just, you know, I used to say like, oh, we don't know if it's happening until the actual thing comes out, yeah. you know, physically. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, you work on stuff sometimes and nothing happens or with the supply chain issue, you work on stuff and in like a two year period and you're like, oh yeah, that, which is what's happening right now. A lot of different Iraq things are happening, but it was because supply chain and like two years of like 
you know, slow moving and now everything's just kind of like coming out at the same time, which is kind of dope, but not planned. Um, so yeah, there's like stuff happening and like hopefully there's more stuff. And uh, again, I appreciate any opportunity that anyone gives me is super awesome to work with people. And I like to like learn about myself and the world through doing these creative things. So that's great. Sharing stuff with people is the best. That's what my art is about in my drawings. I just wanted to say is that when I was like trying to be the best artist ever and like bust out masterpieces like in an hour, nothing, right? But when I was like, oh, like, like what should the show do? What should I do? Like trying to do people smiling and the best smile and most beautiful. But when I was like, oh, like, you know, I'm really lucky. I'm like, like everybody I know is like super talented and nice. And like, that's like really hard to come by. And I have a nice family and like, you know, and I'm like, well, that, that's it then. That's your art. It doesn't have to be like social justice or like abstract. It could just be that. Like what, you know? So I was like, so me sharing that my community with people is that's, it makes it so easy. It's like a no brainer. Um, retelling the story of these people's faces, the map of their face or their body or both. It's a great responsibility that I really love to have. Right. And that in and of itself is like, helps me, I think, more than it helps anybody else, but also I get to share the product with everybody else, which is this crazy network, which I could trip out on, but I won't, of how we're all connected and like all these, you know what I mean? But that's like for like later, if I make it to 70 and we're at Yale talking about my art career. But that's basically what the art is, is like, it's not about me. It's about like all these other people. Can you like, can you dig it? It's insane. Um, and, uh, yeah, so thank you for like anybody who like, you know, sends me nudes for that or like participates or lets me draw them or whatever. That's great. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that they're all connected because for a while I wanted to keep Iris Knott and Kunle Martins over here. And then I was just like, no, the value is in it being like, you know, all together. And yeah, thank you guys for like asking me to do this. This was really awesome. I know I went on and on and on. <laughs> I hate talking, <laughs> um, but thank you for, this yeah. has been cool. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you for your time. For real. Yeah, man. Immense thank you yeah. for coming on the show. Sure, like, sure. My pleasure. Like yo. Angel said previously, like you're just such a staple and like just Absolutely. creating so thank much. You guys are so like, sweet. Thank you dude, so much. And it's like this ripple effect that has motivated like Absolutely. more youth than you can even imagine yeah. into <laughs> participating in this, like these subcultures that are very necessary in today's society. And I'm like sitting here in my corner and like I said like two words, but like, yo, it's such a trip having you on the show. <laughs> and like you. just know that we thank you. Yeah, we appreciate it. Dude, you guys are so nice. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Peace. Thank you. Thank you. Peace.